Well, what time is it, Lord? I, I, I've, got, I've got a couple of things, but I think I'm going to do this thing. Amen. Turn with me to Ezekiel chapter 37. Ezekiel chapter 37. Now, what I'm about to share is basically a pattern that we see all through the scriptures. And you see it in different places. Today, we're going to study about uh, Ezekiel and the Valley of Dry Bones. But we're going to see uh, the same pattern that we see in Jeremiah and uh, even in the birthing of Jesus. And, it, you know, everything God does, he does according to a pattern or based on a principle. Amen. God doesn't move outside of his pattern and his principles. Amen. And I've always said this, you know, once you learn God's principles and God's patterns, the scriptures open up to you and you see it everywhere. Now, this is in, in Ezekiel 37, starting in verse 1. Ezekiel says, The hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley which is full of bones and caused me to pass by them round about. And behold, there were very many in the open valley and lo, they were very dry. And he said, and he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, thou knowest. Again he saith unto me, Prophesy unto these bones, and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and ye shall live, and I will lay sinews upon you, and will bring up flesh upon you. Now sinews, I uh, looked that up and it means um, tendons. It means um, uh, muscle strength. It's, it's what it does actually is it holds the muscles together. Okay. And he said, and I will lay sinews upon you and will bring up flesh upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and ye shall live and ye shall know that I am the Lord. Now notice there's a process here. And he said, so I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied there was a noise, and behold a shaking. And the bones came together, bone to his bone. And when I beheld, lo, the sinews and the flesh came up upon them, and the skin covered them above, but there was no breath in them. Then said he unto me, prophesy unto the wind. The word wind there, it's got a little two in my Bible and you go over to the center column and what it means is breath, the breath. And uh, he, said, uh, he said unto me, prophesy unto the breath, prophesy son of man and say to the wind or to the breath, thus saith the Lord God, come from the four winds uh, o breath, and breathe upon these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood up upon their feet, an exceeding great army. Now, this is a, a, a vision that God gave Jeremiah, uh, excuse me, Ezekiel concerning the nation of Israel. But we know that in the Old Testament, the Old Testament is full of types and shadows. Everything in there is a type and a shadow of Christ or and his church. So we see this then, and prophetically speaking, as we share this today, I want you to understand that he is talking to us, the church. Everybody say us. Okay. And the first thing that, that God did, he says, the hand of the Lord was upon Ezekiel. Now, the hand of the Lord means the anointing. Now, in the Old Testament, the anointing would come on the prophet. It didn't live in the prophet, didn't stay in the prophet just like it does us today, but it would come on the prophet for a certain thing at a certain time. And so the hand of the Lord or the anointing of God was upon him. And, um, and so, first of all, first of all, what we see here is God does nothing without his anointing. Anything pertaining to his kingdom that is accomplished in this earth today, it is accomplished because the anointing is involved. See, Jesus himself, 
Of course, he was born of a virgin. Of course, he was, had the life of God in him. But until he was 30 years old, he didn't heal anybody. He didn't cast out any devils. He didn't do any of those things. And the reason was he wasn't anointed. He had the authority as a man to operate and function in this earth. See, God does nothing except he uses a man. The dominion of this earth belongs to mankind. Amen. And so Jesus, even though he was the son of God, he didn't operate as a man, as a God. He operated here as a, as a man. And so it was only after he was baptized by John and the spirit of the Lord came upon him, that is he became anointed, that he went into the synagogue in Luke chapter four, verse 18. And then he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me for he has anointed me. He didn't say that before. He said that after the spirit of God came upon him and he's anointed him. And he goes on to tell what he was anointed for. Acts 10, 38 says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power who went about doing good and healing all that were pest of the devil. Now, if God needed to anoint Jesus to get anything done, then guess what we got to have from God? And that is the anointing. Amen. Everybody say, I'm anointed. Then the next thing he said, he, he showed us Ezekiel the valley of dry bones. See, God had to get somebody to see something. See, he can't do it. See, God can't do anything until somebody gets anointed. He can't do anything until he gets somebody to see what he's seeing. Amen. So what he's seeing is he's showing Ezekiel because, see, let me tell you something. There are many people in the church today are blinded. They can't see the valley of dry bones. They can't even see that they are dried up and they're dead on the vine. Because the, the, it was so subtle when the devil came in and he stole a little life here and he stole a little life there and he stole a little life here and you don't even know what's going on until you wake up one day and you're high and dry. Are you listening to me now? Because I'm talking to us. Amen. I'm talking to us that, that we find out we're dry. We don't have the fire that we used to have. We don't have the anointing we used to have. We don't have the excitement that we used to have. See, they become, because we are dry. And the devil has come in. The thief cometh but for to kill, steal, and destroy. And before we knew it, and we didn't even understand it, there was things being sucked out of us by this world system, by tests, by trials, by warfare, by pleasures of this life, by all kinds of things, all kinds of distractions to pull the very life of God out of us. Amen. But so God's got to wake us up first and he's got to understand, he's got to help us see that we are not what we thought we were. We're not where we used to be. He's got to help us see that we've dried up because if we don't get over that we're dried up, there's nothing we will ever do to get undry. Amen. Amen. So Ezekiel had to see something. He didn't, he didn't know, he knew Israel had problems. He knew uh, a lot of things, but see, God was trying to show him how, how the whole system had fallen and it had dried up. And, see, and, and, and he said, you see this? See, nothing can happen until we see it. If we don't, if we don't see we need to get excited, we won't get excited. If we don't see that we need to grow, we won't grow. If we don't see that we need to change, we won't change. Amen? We won't do anything until we see ourselves, first of all, in the condition that we're in. Then we know we got somewhere to go. Now, I know we have to have a vision, and I know we have to be looking forward, but you can't look forward if you don't know where you are. Because if you don't know where you are, you don't know if you're looking forward or to the side or looking backward. If you don't know where you are, so God has to, first of all, show us where we are, that we are dry. We are like dead bones. We're just, uh, we're just laying there with no function, with no purpose, with no destiny, with no vision, no reason to even get up in the morning. Just go through the motion. Let's go to church. Why? Because that's what we do. Amen. But I'm not expecting God to be there. I'm not expecting excitement to be there. I'm not expecting anything to happen because, you know, we've been going through the motions here lately. But see, now that's that, 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 that you need to change. We got to change our thinking first. God's got to get us to see where we are. Amen. Now, once God gets us to see where we are, then God asks Ezekiel a question. Can these bones live? Listen to me. 
God is trying to get an answer, the right answer, out of Ezekiel. What he's trying to do is to get Ezekiel to say, yes, sir. But Ezekiel couldn't altogether say that, but, he's, but he did say, Lord, you know. Mm -hmm. Lord, you know if they can or not. But what he understands is if, God, if, he, if, if it couldn't happen, God wouldn't have been asking him to start with. Amen. And so he said, Lord, thou knowest. Now, when he said, Lord, thou knowest, what he did, he began to speak of, in faith. See, you got, you're going to believe something. Everybody believes something. Everybody believes something about God. Everybody, everybody. It may be their God. It might not be the God of the Bible. But everybody believes something about God. Everybody believes something about death. Everybody believes something about eternity. Amen. Some people believe there is no God, but they're believing something. Amen. Well, see, in order for God to do what he wants to do, he's got us to get us to believe what he wants to do. That's why he gives us vision. He gave him the vision so that he could see and vision is future tense, but somebody's got to believe the vision. See, you have, to approach, you have to approach the kingdom of God with faith. See, I heard our, your president a few weeks ago uh, stand up and say, you know, you can't go by everything in the Bible because if you, oh, no, this is what he said, you've got to, you've got to take the scripture and, and, and mix reason with it. Because he went back and quoted some Old Testament verse back there. Amen. Uh, but see, uh, that's an ignorance, ignorant man. Amen. Because you don't approach the word of God with reason. You approach the word of God with faith. And you might not understand every part of it, but you've got to trust God and believe God. If you're not going to believe the Bible is the word of God, what are you going to believe? You're going to believe part of it? I'm going to believe this part over here because I like it and it applies to me and it makes me happy and it makes me feel good. But I'm not going to believe this part over here because I don't know. God, no, no, it's either all inspired by God, it's all God's word, or none of it's God's word. So we've got to, here's what's happened. God is bringing Ezekiel to a place where he's got to believe something. He's either got to believe that these bones can live or he's got to believe they can't live. Amen. See, we have to believe something. We have to believe that this move of God is going to spread throughout this church and it's going to spread throughout this community and it's going to spread throughout this 25 mile race. We got to believe that. If we don't believe that, then what do you believe? You got to believe that something supernatural is taking place. You got to believe it. That's why we're showing you the pictures. That's why we're having the testimony so that we can all partake of it because it's not just one little group. It's the whole church. We got to get the whole church excited. We got to get the whole church involved in some way. Amen. And somehow we've got to be, when one member rejoices, we all rejoice together. Amen. Amen. What do we believe then? Do we believe the prophecies that went, went before over this place? Do we believe it's going to be a world training center? Do we believe there's going to be a, a huge uh, 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 center on the top of this hill up here? Do we believe it's going to be a campus? Do we believe uh, all the things that's been said about us? Do we believe those prophecies? Or do we just look at the circumstances and look at the fact that, well, this one's left and that one's left and this one's done this and this we must be going downhill? Are you going to believe that? You're going to believe something. I'd rather believe that the greatest days are yet ahead. I'd rather believe that the path of the just is a shining light that shineth more. Than I, I'd rather believe that our best days are in front of us. I believe that we're going to have the greatest outpouring we've ever seen. We're not going, we've never seen anything like we're about to say. It's never existed before in this place. And I believe, praise God, that we're in the process. I believe that we're in the beginning of it. I believe we're just at the edge of the river today. But I thank you, God, there is a river not just attending ankle deep, but we can swim in. You got to believe some people. Yeah. Hallelujah. God's got to get us to believe like he does. <laughs> can these things live? Do you think, do you think that God didn't know where they could or not? 
Is he trying to find out from Ezekiel, can these things live? <laughs> Hello? Don't you know that God knew it all the time? So he's not trying to find out himself. God knows everything. He's, omni he's omniscient, amen? So he knows, he knows, but he's gotta get Ezekiel to confess to it. He's gotta get Ezekiel to know it. God, God wants to do everything I just said. God, I, 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 I've never been under a stronger anointing in my life. He wants to do everything, but he wants us to do everything, but he wants us to agree with it. We got to believe for it, hallelujah. We gotta say it with our mouth. We got to quit looking at things the way they are now. We got to look to the future. We got to look whatsoever thing you desire. Your desire is your future. Your desire is your vision. Hallelujah. What do we want to see? Whatever we want to see, we've got to believe that it exists. We've got to believe that God's doing it. Amen. At what point? What point do we believe the move of God is going on? I mean, at 50 something kids, people, not just kids, but some of them adults and some of them teenagers are filled with the Holy Ghost. Well, how much more is it going to take for you to believe that there's a move of God going on? Would 60 do it? Would 70 do it? Would 80 do it? Would 100 do it? How much? Uh uh. How many would it take? It's all by faith anyway. Amen. You. Y'all are about to excite me down up here, y'all. <laughs> Hallelujah. Then when uh, something, then before God can do anything, there always has to be. See, this is, this is what God wants to do. See, th th he's a prophet. Ezekiel's a prophet. There always has to be a prophetic announcement. God can do nothing in his kingdom. God can do nothing for the body of Christ until there is a prophetic announcement. The word of God says that God will do nothing except he reveals his secrets to his servants, the prophets. Amen. Now, you know, that's Old Testament. That's Old Testament. Do you know, do you know that in, in the New Testament, we're all prophets? Not necessarily the ministry of the prophets. Some people have a special ministry. But he, uh, where, where's that scripture? It kept coming to me, but I don't remember. I would to God that all God's children were prophets. Y'all remember that? Y'all remember that? What did Paul say? You can all prophesy. Mm -hmm. Y'all are all a bunch of little prophets. Why? Because you can say things with your, the confession of your mouth and it'll come to pass. So now, even though he said this, he said, God will do nothing except he revealed his secrets to his servants, the prophets. It's not saying today that in this day, in the day of grace, that there has to be a prophet to prophesy something because we are prophetic. Uh, amen. I said, amen. What are we doing when, when we come in here and we pray and we prophesy and we see a door open? What do we do when we see the fire kindle? What do we see and what's happening? We are making, we are making prophetic announcements. We are speaking prophetically. We are, we are praying in the spirit. We're not praying out of our mind. We're not praying out of our head. We're praying in the Holy Ghost. We're, we're praying anointed prayers from God. And so now it's not, you can, you can prophesy to your own life. You can prophesy over your children. You can prophesy over your home. Well, you can prophesy over yourself because we are prophets and God does nothing except he, in other words, God's going to reveal his will and get somebody to say it before he can ever do anything. He's doing something and he's wanting it done. Thank God. We're having a move of God because somebody prophesied. We've been prophesying. We've been praying out the word of God. It may have come out in prayer, but it's still prophecy. It's prophetic intercession. It's prophetic prayer. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. Now, Here's something that has to happen. Verse 7, Ezekiel did what God said because God said, all right, I, we, I need an announcement here. So how about you start prophesying? Prophesy to these bones. And, 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 and Ezekiel obeyed. In the seventh verse, he obeyed and began to prophesy. So it takes obedience. We have to be obedient, don't we? I mean, when you don't, well, you have to be obedient just when you feel good. Just when you had a good day. 
just when everything else is, everything is going fine in your house. It's wonderful on your job. Everything is wonderful. It is your best life now. And that's when you obey. <laughs> when do you obey? All the time. We do what God says. Now watch this. Verse 7, when he began to prophesy, something began to happen. When we begin to speak what God is trying to do, when we begin to prophesy that like I was doing a while ago. Did you know I was under a heavy, 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 heavy uh, prophetic anointing? Um, amen. I don't know if you felt it back there, but I don't feel that way all the time. Amen. Something is, it's not going to happen. Something's already happening. Amen. And so when he began to prophesy, then there was a noise. And there was a shaking. See, there's always a shaking and there's always knowing a noise that accompanies the move of God. Things always get shaken up. God rarely follows the pattern of religion. He is always, a move, move, a move of God is usually always started outside, and always really outside of any kind of religious order. God said, I'll do a new thing. So what are we going to do? I mean, God doing something on Friday night, so, but it doesn't fit with the pattern of, the, of our religion. So what are we going to do? We're going to shut it down? Because it's on the wrong night, because we're feeding them, because it's children. Ain't nobody listening to me? Amen. What are we gonna do? No, we're gonna we don't want we're gonna go with the flow. I said we're gonna go with the flow. And if God's moving over here, I'm gonna come over here, Bell. <laughs> uh, if he hadn't been moving over there, I'm gonna go over there. Mm -hmm. I mean, if he's moving over there and I don't like well, I don't like the, where he's moving, I ain't going over here. Uh, thank you, Lord Jesus. See, uh, see, see, all these kids start getting filled with the Holy Ghost. And I'm mean, talking about on Friday, and now find out five filled Holy Ghost this morning. And see, it's spreading, it's, it's breaking out. I find out how many of y'all have filled with Holy Ghost? Uh, with? Four filled with the Holy Ghost on Wednesday, seven rededications, two salvations. Two salvations? Uh, four filled with the Holy Ghost? You see, it's breaking out there. It's breaking out everywhere. It'll eventually, it'll eventually make its way in here and some of you dry bones. <laughs> well, we better, we better not do that. <laughs> so now see, this is, this, this is what happens. <laughs> this is what happens. <laughs> Well, praise God. I think she got it. Some, <laughs> amen. So there was a shaking and there was a noise that began to take place. But what's happening, what caused the noise? Because as the prophecy began to go forth, the bones started coming together. And if there's ever going to be a move of God, then the body of Christ has to come together. All the members have to come together. Now, once they begin to come together, things begin to happen. After they came together, after they came together, after they came together, then God started putting muscles and tendons, sinews, skin. But there's no need to put muscle and skin and tissue and tendons on a, on a hand that's not connected to the body. The people that are going to experience the move of God are not going to be the ones that have sat around and did nothing to make it happen. If this was just a sovereign act of God, then why is God doing it? Why isn't he doing it in every church? Why isn't he doing it all over the world? 
If it's just a sovereign move of God, if something wasn't set in motion, if somebody didn't fit the pattern, if somebody wasn't anointed, if somebody didn't hear from God, if somebody didn't see something everybody else wants to see, if the pattern is the same, then see, see there's three kinds of people in the church. There's the people that make things happen, the people that watch things happen, and the people that don't know what's happening. Amen. We're trying to get across to the people that don't know what's happening. Because let me tell you something, the move of God can pass you by and you'll miss the whole thing and not even know that God was moving. Now, after the body comes together, after God has put all the, the thing together, then there's still just dead bodies. See, Adam was formed from the dust of the earth, and that's all he was, was just dust and dirt created out of this earth. That's all he was. He wasn't alive. He wasn't alive. He had a form, and that form was the only thing that designated him from the, from the ground beside him. See, you've got, you've got soil, you've got ground all around him, but, but the only thing that distinguishes him from the rest of the ground, because it's all the same material, the only thing that was different was that he had a form about him. Amen? Well, guess what? God had to do something. Because there's one element that has to be involved here, or else it stays dead. God had to breathe into him. And when he breathed into him, he became alive. You remember when Jesus was walking down the road to, uh, to Emmaus, uh, the disciples were, and Jesus came up beside them and began to talk to him. They didn't recognize who they were, and he finally revealed himself to them. And the Bible says he breathed on them. He breathed on them. And they received the Holy Ghost. See, I, I saw it yesterday. I saw it yesterday in prayer. I saw it yesterday. I can still see it. See, all you need, all you need, all you need after you've come together. Now, see, watch this. All the coming together, you have to, you have to participate in that. You have to be willing. The arm bone can't say to the, you know, to the, Elbow, I don't have any need of you. I don't want to be hooked up with you. See, when we come together, we have to, we have to, we have a part to play in that. We, we get to decide. We don't get to decide what part we are, but we do get to decide to hook up where we belong in the right place at the right joint. Amen. But then there's a, then there's a part that God plays. And it's, it's really just basically only God and God himself. And that's when he breathes on us. I had a, when I lived over at, uh, over at Brother Hanley's over there on the hill, the first time we lived there, the place had not been remodeled and it was high ceilings, no insulation. I used to joke about, you know, in the wintertime when the wind would blow and it blow the covers off the bed. I mean, it was, it was bad, 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 bad cold in the house. And we didn't have money to buy gas. And so we heated with wood. And so we had this wood heater. You loaded it through the side. And um, what happened was, is I learned, it took me a while to learn how to do it because I loaded up at night. And uh, it'd, be, it'd be burnt out by morning. You get up in the morning and everybody's freezing. Then you got to take time. It's takes a long time to get a fire going. Amen. So what I did is I learned, I learned that every night before we went to bed, I would fill that thing with logs. And then I would turn, turn the air way down. So it was just a little bit of air going in there. And when we we'd get up in the morning... You ought to see these. You ought to see Geraldine, myself, and all these kids around that heater. But anyway, when we would get up in the morning, they would, those those logs would be laying in there, charred. They had just enough 
just enough air to make them charge. And all I'd have to do was turn the air on. Immediately, we had a roaring fire. Amen. That's all some of you need. That's all, uh, all any of us. We just need God now to breathe his breath on us and our fire will begin to blaze again. Father, breathe on us. Breathe on us. Breathe on us. And even, yes, Lord, we thank you for what you've done, but we're not satisfied. We can't ever be satisfied. And the Bible says that they stood up. Once they're alive, they're healed, they stood up. And what'd you have? An exceeding great army. You don't need an army if you're not going to fight. And you don't need an army if you're not going to possess something. God is is doing something, and he wants to do more. We are seeing a move of God, and thank God for it. But there's much more that he wants to do. Why don't you stand up with me right now? Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus.